Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I do. Dave says summer look, and yeah, I like the summer. I like the sun a lot. So I won't get off on it. I. <laughs> But I, never mind. I, I'm really tempted, but I just, I got to refrain myself, restrain. Thank you, Lord. It's all good. God created it all, and he said it was good, and I believe that. Amen. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray for a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. We just thank you so much for your goodness, for your power. God, you're amazing. Lord, you've come to rescue us, to transform us into your image, Lord, to cause us to rule and reign with you, to have dominion, Lord, in your name. So, Lord, we just thank you for the greatness of your power, the greatness of all you're doing. God, today, we just open our hearts and our lives to receive more revelation, more of the reality of the kingdom of God in our hearts and our lives and our spirit. God, just pour out, Lord, your presence right now. Pour out your goodness Pour it out, God. Your purpose right now is to transform us. Your purpose right now is to change us. Your purpose right now is to re re reveal, Lord, things to us though, that will change our lives, that will transform our hearts, our spirit. God, so Lord, we just open ourselves right now to the transforming work of Christ, to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we just open ourselves right now to receive the goodness of the Lord. We just want to feast on you today, Jesus. We want to feast on all that you have for us. God, pour it out, Lord. Pour it out. God, we just release miracle power right now in the name of Jesus. You're here, and you can do miracles. It's nothing for you to do a miracle, to heal a body, to deliver a soul. God, to bring freedom and liberty into someone's life. God, to break oppression, to set the captive free. God, that's what you're here to do, Lord, is to enhance uh, by a mega times, Lord, our life right now to take us, Lord God, into greater places in you, greater places of your glory. So come, Jesus, now. Come, Lord. We just welcome your presence and even in a greater measure. We just say, come, Lord Jesus. You are the one that we adore. I adore you, Jesus. I worship you. We set our hearts right now on you. We fix our hearts just in greater and greater focus on you today, Jesus. We allow you to be king and Lord and all that you want us to do, God, to direct our steps, to fill our hearts, our lives, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the manifestation of your power right now. Thank you for the manifestation of your power right now. The manifestation of your power, Lord, right now in our midst. God, in our physical body, Lord, in our soul and our spirit, Lord, thank you for the power of God that's here right now. Thank you for the power of God that's here right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You're here to do, God, practical and spiritual things, God, to do both, God, physical and spiritual, Lord. You're here to do both of them, Lord. So we just release you right now in the name of Jesus. We just release you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the power of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. A couple of weeks ago, last week was so awesome. John Neese spoke and about community, about love. And think about the church in the book of Acts. Think about when that was all birth. Probably, the, to me, the two defining marks, the two defining characteristics of that church was power. He says, you'll, he says, wait and you'll be endued with power from on high. So he's instructing the church to come with power. So in Acts 2, the, the power of the Holy Spirit fell in the church. And then out of that power, there's this incredible community of love that was born. And they shared all things, uh, freely gave to each other all things. It was, you know, Michelle was talking about the 10%. And uh, people cringe and they think, oh, that's legalism. And that's Old Testament, which is not. Jesus affirmed it in the New Testament. And, uh, but what, <laughs> what I want to say is, well, if you don't like the Old Testament standard, just take the New Testament standard and just sell everything that you have that's excess and give it all away, and then you're good. So, you know, it's probably a, a way, way higher than 10%, but if you don't like the old, then take the new and walk in that, and some of you are cringing, so maybe I'll, I don't know if I should back off or invite me in for more. <laughs> hey, 
the power we want. <laughs> oh. We say we want God, but sometimes he's, he's does, he does, I'm not saying something, probably all the time, he's going to do things that are going to take us way beyond ourselves, way beyond our comfort zones, way beyond what we are currently in our, our current state. So he's going to constantly be assaulting our status quo, our current situation, how we view things, how we, we do things. And uh, so when you invite the Lord to come in, he is, uh, well, we're going to talk about it here, so I'll, I'll get into it. First Corinthians chapter 2, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the power of God, and I want to continue on that theme. And verse 1, it says, when I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, this is amazing. Here's the Apostle Paul, one of the most learned, probably one of the most learned men of his day, uh, taught by the greatest teacher of the day, uh, was well advanced. He was basically a rising superstar Pharisee in that his sect of Judaism. And he says, I didn't come to you with lofty speech or wisdom, which he was certainly able to do. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It was in the power of the cross, proclaiming Christ, proclaiming Jesus. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And so Paul, when he spoke, really wasn't a, this incredible orator. Uh, he says he was with them in weakness and in fear and much trembling. So it, it would have been interesting to hear Paul speak. It would have been interesting to kind of see his manner. And obviously he was imparting an incredible revelation but his presentation may not have been the most impressive, I guess I'll put it that way. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So when Paul came to speak to the church at Corinth, he says, I really didn't come to wow you with my wisdom. I came to make a demonstration of the spirit and power. That was Paul's objective. He said, when I came to talk to you, I want to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit and, and how... Uh, how powerful that how he is how, how great that he is the demonstration of the spirit and in power then verse 5 is what I want to focus on for a while that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God so here's Paul the greatest teacher maybe of, of his day the most learned man of his day and he's saying, I'm not going to, I, I'm, I'm not encouraging you, I'm not directing you really to, I want to say this, maybe specific truths in the scripture, though our faith rests on the word of God. But Paul's saying, I want your faith, what you're believing in, what you're trusting in, what you're directing your life into, I want it actually to rest in the power of God. I want your faith to be directed to the power of God. I think, I don't know, maybe because I'm thinking about it and I'm on it right now, I think maybe one of the greatest needs in our, at least the Western church, is the power of God. I think we, because Paul says, I don't want your faith resting in the wisdom of men. I think that we, and, and so Paul obviously saw, I don't know if conflict's the right word, but he saw a choice. He said, you can either let your faith rest in the wisdom of men, what man thinks is right, how smart he is, his plans, his intelligence, his, his you know, provisions, what he, what, you know, the number one best-selling book, whatever, however you want to put it. When I start getting specific, then it's going to get ugly, so I don't know what <laughs> specific to get. So you can put your faith in the wisdom of men, or you can put your faith in the power of God. Paul says this is your choice. You get the, the, either it's going to be in the wisdom of man, or it's in the power of God. I think most people and most Christians, we gravitate, again, I've talked a lot before about, we are so saturated in our Greek culture, our Western culture, Greek mindset, rationalism. Uh, we so exalt our intellectual ability to solve all of our problems that our, it, what's, we're saturated with is to trust in the wisdom of men. We're, we're saturated, our, our knee-jerk response, how we've been raised, how we've been trained, is to trust in the wisdom of man. I, I'm going to see what's the best solution out there. What does people have to say? Who's the greatest voice in a particular field? And I'm going to trust in, I'm going to put my faith in that particular person. Again, this is where it gets ugly, because you say, well, why can't, why can't I have both? Why can't I have 
the wisdom of man, and why can't I have the power of God? Well, Paul said he doesn't do that. Paul says, I don't do that. You said, I, I don't trust, I don't, put my, I don't let my faith rest in the wisdom of men. I'm letting my faith rest in the power of God. So, so you have to decide where is my faith going to rest? Where am I going to where am I going to let my faith rest? Is it in the wisdom of men? Is it in the things that man, man says? There's honestly there's so many ways to build a church. I just use this as an example, one way, and you can get you can go to a lot of conferences. You can go, see a lot of uh, things online. You can there's lots of tons of books that are written about church growth. You can have all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that they're all the wisdom of man. I'm not saying that because I believe that God inspires people and gives them ideas and things like that. But I think that you can, <laughs> uh, this gets challenging, um, you can get into, well, what is the, you can get into the business model. You can get into the corporate model. You can get into, well, here's what church, church growth strategists talk about, how to grow and build a church. My heart personally is to build the church on the power of God. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. I want the church, uh, what's always been in my heart for decades, a long, long, long time, has been to, Lord, I want to, to see that when the power of God is manifest and tangible and real within the church, I personally don't believe there's any problem with church growth. If, again, if we had, if I had 20 wheel people in wheelchairs out here and people started coming out of wheelchairs and the power of God, church growth would not be a problem. I guarantee you next week or the next day, all everybody that heard would be, would, you know, if it was on the news, you just would have this place packed, probably people around the block wanting to be touched by the power of God. So I, I can choose, do I want to do it by the wisdom of man? And I'm, I'm not trying to pigeonhole certain people in the wisdom of man, but I, my choice is I'm choosing the power of God. I'm choosing to rest my faith. What I'm pursuing is the power of God. I want to walk in the power. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to walk in the power of the resurrection of Christ that's living within me. I want to walk in that power. So Paul's saying, rest your faith. Let your faith rest in his power. And I, I think sometimes what we do is we try the wisdom of men, and then maybe after a period of time, sometimes even years, when it doesn't work out, we say, well, maybe I'll... Maybe I'll ask God for that. We get desperate enough, and we turn to God, and we actually get the power to break, get the breakthrough that we need to do in our life. So I think sometimes the power of God ends up being almost the second choice or the choice of last resort. It becomes a thing that, well, okay, everything else has failed, and so now I'm going to, it's like the woman with the issue of blood. She spends all her money trying to get healed, and then finally she says, you know what, I'm just going to touch Jesus. The power comes out of Christ. The virtue flows out of his, his garments into her, and the, the issue of blood is dried up, and she's healed. She's whole. She's made uh, healthy in that moment of time. So I am interested. I want the power of God. I want my faith to rest in it. So my hope is in the power. My hope, my, my expectation, Lord, whatever is going to change in my life, it's because of your power. Whatever is going to be uh, transformed in my life. Whenever I'm going to, when we talk about rest, you're talking about spiritually inheritance. You're talking about Hebrews 3 and 4. When you enter into his rest, you enter into his inheritance. So when I'm going to enter into the fullness of what God has for me, and I'm entering into that, it's going to happen because I'm, my, my faith is resting in the power of God. So I'm saying, Lord, if I'm going to get into my inheritance, I'm saying, I'm going to establish my faith in the power of God. That power is going to bring me into my inheritance. It's going to bring me into the fullness of what I've called to walk in, in Christ. We need the power. You need the power of God. We all need, if the church, Zion, Spokane, is going to come into our phones, we need the power. Honestly, the power is going to be the only thing that's going to bring us into our fullness, the power of God. Within that power will be a transformative community of love and a community of people who are laying down their lives and giving themselves to one another and doing powerful things. But we're in that place. My trust is in the power. My hope is in the power. My future is dependent on the power of God. My family's future is dependent on the power of God. What I'm believing for in my life is dependent on the power of God. So what, whatever I look like in six months, 
or a year from now or five years from now, it's going to be because the power of God has come into my life and changed me into that person, changed me into the man that I'm called to be. So it's that fixing, it's that positioning, it's that posture of saying, Lord, I'm expecting, Paul's saying, my faith, my whole faith is resting in the power of God. God's power is going to come to me and transform me in a mighty way. So I need the power of God to move anything forward in my life. Again, I talked about a couple weeks ago. We think that, well, I have certain abilities and certain talents and certain giftings which are wonderful, and I'll kind of gradually, incrementally kind of make things happen. I believe that we can come to moments of power encounters, power transformation that radically change our life. We can go, again, we talked about going from one level to another level of living. I believe that's what the Lord's calling us to do. We talked about in Ephesians 1.19, the immeasurable greatness, power that cannot be measured, the measurable greatness of his power towards us who believes. So our faith, our believing is what releases this immeasurable greatness of his power that, towards us who believe. So Paul's saying, my faith is resting on the power of God. There's this power that's working within me. We talked about uh, that gives us exceedingly abundantly beyond all that I can ask or think according to the power that's working within me. So there's this power that the Lord is releasing, has released and into our hearts, into our lives in this, this posture of positioning ourselves, of faith, of believing that says, Lord, I can be transformed into another person. I can be changed into another person. I can come into a place where I am uh, radically changed into another man, another woman. So you are not a helpless victim. You are not a helpless victim. You are not chained to your past. You are not just waiting for someone to do something for you. You are not just waiting for somebody to do something for you, whether, whatever it is, a raise at work, Mr. Right to come into your life, whatever it is. You're not waiting for somebody else to do something for you. You have the power of Christ in you to completely transform your life. You're not a victim of your past. Whether, and I'm not trying to be trivial about this, whether your mama didn't like you or your dad rejected you, they're deep, deep wounds. I'm not again, trying to trivialize those things. But you have the power is greater that's in you than whatever has come against you. Whatever has come to, to destroy you from the devil, your power of Jesus Christ is greater that's in you right now to transform you into another person. You're not a victim of your past. You're not a victim of whatever you've gone through, whatever is divorce or business failure or people walking out on you or whatever it is. You're not a victim of that past. The power of God that's in you is greater than whatever has come against you. It's ability to change and transform your life. Whatever... <laughs> governmental entity that's come against you. I just caught a hold of Jahi, so I'm going to hit this for a moment. Whatever governmental, whatever court ruling, whatever's coming against you, that will not define you. That cannot define you. The power of Christ in you is the only thing that will be the determining factor what your future is going to look like, whether your faith is going to rest in that power because he has intended for you to be transformed into another image, into the image of Christ. We looked at the verses saying that he wanted all of us to, be, to grow into the, the mature man, the full man, the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ, the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. So, so when we have that as our benchmark, as we have that as our target, as we have that, that's our goal, we're saying the power of God is moving me into that place. Somebody else cannot define me. It cannot measure me in that way. So you're not, you're not waiting to win the lotto. Say that with me. I'm not waiting to win the lotto. We are waiting for just, okay, if I just roll these lucky numbers, or I pick out the right combination of numbers, then my life's going to be transformed. It's a lie of the devil. Let me just say that. It's a lie. You're waiting for, I don't know, for... But go wait for unicorns. I mean, you know, wait for something, you know, wait for, I don't know. It's just, you're, you're waiting for something that's just, it's just, help me, Lord, get the right words. That you're, if you're waiting for that lotto ticket to transform your life, it's a lie of the devil. 
I'm sorry if you buy lotto tickets and you think it's going to transform your life. It's a lie. The power of God is what's going to transform your life. The power of Jesus Christ, not the lotto ticket, the power of Christ <laughs> is going to transform your life. Now, Lord, don't make me buy a lotto ticket because that will look really bad. I have never bought one. I don't want to buy one. If you do it, that's your business. I'm not, but I'm just telling you, you might as well go look for a unicorn. It's just not going to happen. So, so you can move forward with the immeasurable greatness of the power that's working within you. You're free. You're free from your past. You're free from mistakes. You're free from whatever anybody's done to you. You're free. Christ has come to set you free. He's come to break every chain that's in your heart and in your life. He's come whatever sin you've done. There's, there's times where if you've done things wrong, you've sinned, you've done things. There's times for repentance. There's times for confession. There's times for getting clean. There's times when things have been done to you where you need to go through uh, some ministry time. We have an amazing, wonderful ministry, Restoring the Foundations, that helps people walk through some deep inner healings, setting people free from demonic stuff, inner bondages, all that kind of stuff. You can, you can walk through that stuff, but you cannot... You do not have to be stuck in your past. You do not have to be stuck in whatever has happened to you. You can be free. You can be 100% free. You can be completely free. You can have every chain broken in your heart, in your life, in your mind. You can walk with power, in victory, in authority, in dominion. You can be completely free. Whatever words have come against you, whatever has been spoken over you, every lie of the devil, you can break every chain in Jesus' name. You have power. You have power in the name of Jesus. You have power. My faith is resting in the power of God, Paul said. My faith, Paul, this man who knew the scriptures better than any of us, I mean, like way more than any of us, he says, you know what? My faith is resting in the power of God. It's God's power that is going to change me, transform my life, and it's that power that's going to move me. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or think, according to the power that's working, that's energizing within me. So the power of God that's within you can pull you out of any ruts. It, the power of God within you can change the course of your life. None of your destinies is set. I mean, the Lord has a destiny for you, but you're... <laughs> You have the power to, to engage and to change. If you think, well, my life's going in this direction right now, and I'm not really liking it, you have the power to change your life. You're not a helpless victim. You have the power to choose, to choose Christ, to choose his power, and to set your course on the direction that God's called you to do. You're not in a rut. You're not on a merry-go-round just going round and round, hoping you're going to catch the gold ring, you're, you are a, a, a child that's filled with the power of God. So you, have the, you have the power to shift your atmospheres. You have the power to shift your atmosphere. Personally, over your own life, I'm depressed. I feel hopeless. I feel uh, fearful. I feel whatever. You have the power. You have the power. You have the power to shift the atmospheres over your life right now. If you're under a cloud of depression, you have power right now in Jesus' name to transform your life. You have power to change your life. You have, I'm spitting on myself. You have power to make changes in your life. You're not a helpless victim. You're a mighty man or woman of God. You are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that's in you. That's moving in your life. You can break your circumstances. You can change the course of your life, the destiny of your life. You can become great and mighty and powerful in Jesus' name. You have that choice. You have that ability. You can stop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> such a nice, warm, fuzzy summer message. You can stop blaming other people. You can stop blaming your past, what somebody did or didn't do to you. The power of God is working within you. It's taking you well beyond, beyond whatever you can ask or think. So your faith is resting in the power of God. Where does, Paul says, my faith is resting in the power. And that power can take us beyond all, all of God's things. So this thing that's inside of each one of you, where are, what are the limits? Where's the boundaries of that power? There isn't any. 
it's, you're, you're determining it. You're determining your power. You're determining what your life's going to look like. It's, you're not chained to somebody else. If you say, oh, I'm chained to a bad marriage. You're, you can change your marriage. You can change the atmosphere of your marriage. You have a, it may take time. It may take focus. It may take going at it. It may take going through some steps. It may, God gives you some directions, some things to do practically. It may take all that. But you're not a victim. You're not stuck. You can change whatever circumstance you're in. You can change that situation. We're, we're called to walk in the power of God. So we, there, there really there is no limits. There's no place that the power of God can't take me. The power of God that's within me can transform me into a person I can't even think about right now. I, I can't, real honest, I can't even imagine right now the places that God can take me and how what I could look like with the power of God. I, I don't, it's beyond what I can ask or think. And so there's a power that's in me that's working in me to take me beyond something I can't even imagine right now. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, great verse. So what is this power doing? This power that's in me is bringing me beyond whatever I can ask or think. It's, my, my, it's what my faith is resting in, in this power. So 2 Corinthians, uh, oops, I got 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians 10, 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, or not carnal, that are not of the flesh, but have divine power. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, are not carnal, but they have divine power. You have weapons. You, you, are, a, you are a commando. You are a green beret. You, are, you have weapons you don't even realize you have. You have spiritual weapons that are not of the flesh. It's not an AK-47. It's spiritual weapons that you have to destroy. The, the power of God is in you to destroy things in your life, to destroy certain things that are there in your life. It says they're not of the, uh, excuse me, they're not of the flesh, but have divine power. Your weapons that God gives you, maybe it's the word of prophecy, maybe it's a gift of healing, maybe it's a word of wisdom, it's, it's whatever that weapon is that God's given you, the power of the Holy Spirit. Those weapons have divine power. You are all equipped. You all have power in you. you it's not just a generic power. It's not just like, okay, yeah, you all have power. No, you have specific things that give you, give you specific powers. I get it. You get into the game world because the game world is just, just copying the, the reality of the spiritual world. So you have specific powers to destroy things that are demonic, that, are, that afflict you, that begin to want to block you, that want to stop you. You have power in you to destroy things. So for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to what? To destroy strongholds. There's strongholds in our life. There's strongholds in that that of, of, of thought in our life that these weapons are given to destroy those. It says we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, the obedience of Christ. So there's this power that's within me that is going to, and I'm going to take it just in ourselves first because you can take it within a broader context, but just looking at ourselves first. There's a power that's working within me and within you. What is this power doing? The power that's working within me, that's energizing me, that's, that's pulling me into the image of Christ, what is it doing? It is beginning to destroy the arguments that I've set up in my own mind. It's beginning to take off every lofty thing, every lofty thought, every thought that is uh, somehow against the knowledge of God, that power is working and breaking those strongholds of thought in my mind that are, that are locking me into a place where I think, well, this is who I am. This is who I'm always going to be. You know, this is the way my dad was, or this is what my mom was, whatever. This is the way I'm going to be. That power is working in your life to destroy those arguments that you've raised up against yourself. Well, I'm, my mom was poor, my family is poor, I'm going to be poor. Whatever, there's, there's a thousand different arguments the enemy can bring to us. I'm not rich, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too whatever, I'm not educated enough. I mean, there's just, the, the thoughts just come over and over. These thoughts come to us, and the power of God is destroying those arguments. It's destroying the lies of the enemy that says you can't become who you're called to be. 
that you come, somehow you can't walk in that fullness of God. The power of God is in your life to break every chain, every argument that you've been raised up in your mind, in your life. And some of that stuff, we just get, some of it's in ourselves, some of it's in our family, some of it's in a church culture, some of it's in a national, national culture. There's just lies. There's just things we buy into. Sometimes it's so prevalent. It's so much our culture we don't understand. But the power is coming against those things, and it's breaking arguments. It's breaking those things in our life. It's destroying false opinions about yourself. It's destroying false opinions and thoughts that you have about yourself. I'm too weak. I'm too whatever. I don't have that gift. I don't have that ability. I'm not connected enough. I'm not, you know, whatever. We just, we have all these false opinions about who we are. The power of God is warring against those things in your mind. It is, there, there's something inside of each one of us who've been born in Christ, and it's saying, I'm going to free this person. I'm going to, it's like when they asked uh, Michelangelo, you know, when he carved David, and famous analogy that people talk about, well, how did you see it? And he, they, Michelangelo said, oh, I just, I just cut away everything that wasn't, basically it wasn't David. So this power that's working in us, knows who you're, what you're supposed to become. It, the power of the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God. And so it's, it's chipping away, it's breaking off all the lies, all the opinions, all the arguments, all the stuff that we put against in ourselves. And it's breaking that stuff out of our lives until we are become, become the, the, the image of Christ, the, what, what we're supposed to reflect and to do in Him. We're breaking all those arguments What we do is we build a prison in ourselves of all the thoughts that we think about ourselves. Our thoughts build a prison about ourselves, and we live in that prison. And I'm saying the Lord has called us to be free, to be free of the prison of our thoughts about who we are, what we're able to do, what we're called to do. The Lord wants to break the thoughts in our hearts and our minds that imprison us in the places of limitation, in the places of, I, you know, I don't think I can get there. I can't do that. So there's strongholds of thoughts, opinions, reasonings, speculations. Oh, man. We, we have all these speculations, vain imaginations about our future and our life. And honestly, none of them ever, none of them ever come true. But, you know, we, we, just, we just, we get all these things that kind of want to spin in our head, Spe speculating about our future and what terrible things going to happen to us. And it just, it doesn't, you know, I'm saying 99.99999% of the time, it's not going to happen. So you've got to break that, those thoughts. You've got to break that prison of thoughts, of speculation of, of all those things and allow the power of God to come into your, your life. So what, what's the end game? He says, we destroy arguments, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to the obedient, obedience of Christ. Every, this is an amazing statement. He said, every thought we're going to take captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, I, this is like incredible, because we all have probably, I don't know, thousands of thoughts a day. Every thought, Paul says, can be obedient to Christ. Every thought that runs through my brain, that runs through your brain, every thought, my goal is to take every thought to obey Christ. Yeah. Thoughts in my brain, you will obey Christ. I will not allow any, Bill Johnson talks about it, I, I cannot afford to allow any thoughts to come into me that are not the thoughts that God thinks about me. That's like, wow. That's, that's, out, that's amazing. That's out there. But it's, it's scriptural. It's what this scripture is talking about. Every thought in my brain is going to obey Christ. I have the power that's within me, and that power is going to cause all my thoughts to be taken captive to the obedience of Christ. It's going to break that. that <laughs> what would, I don't know. What would life look like? Every thought that you had during the day, every thought was obedient to Christ, had to bow and if that thought wasn't of Christ, it would just, boom, it would just go. It could not stay in your life. How free would you look? How powerful would you look? How incredible, like, joyful would you look? How hopeful would you be? I mean, like, oh, my gosh. Every thought is obeying Christ. 
every thought is in obedience to Jesus. It's like, it's so life transforming. It's so powerful. What would, if we took every thought captive to, you must obey Christ. Well, oh, that's, you know, that's nice, but you know, can that really happen? He says, every thought obedient to Christ, being ready, <laughs> I love the way he says, being ready to punish every disobedience. One of my favorite, Johnny posted this yesterday or the day before, my favorite baseball videos is Nolan Ryan and this rookie guy. Nolan Ryan is like the, one of the greatest pitchers, pitchers of all time. He's in his 40s and he's pitching and he, he winds up and he beans this guy, you know, hits him, hits the batter and the batter kind of, and then he charges the mound, which occasionally guys do when they get really ticked off. This rookie, so Nolan gets this guy, he's like 44 years old, just starts wailing on this guy, just boom, boom, boom. Finally, they let him go, and it's just awesome. It's like, oh, man, that's great. Like, what do you, well, you don't charge a Hall of Fame pitcher. You just let him do his thing, and you walk to first base, take your lump. And that, yeah, that's what it is. It's just one of the greatest videos of all time, baseball. So I'm ready to punish all disobedience. What does it look like when you get a thought in your life, and you think, hey, that's not Jesus. It's hopelessness coming. And you just take that thing, and you just bam, 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 bam. Just, just smack it. Just exercise some authority. Pound it. You don't belong in my life. Hopelessness, discouragement, depression, suicidal thoughts, all that negativity, bad stuff about other people. Just bam, bam, you lying devil. Get out of my brain. You get no place in me. Just pound the thing. I mean, there's got to be, you know, you got to be some, something, aggression in you. You've got power, use it. Yeah. I mean, you've got power that's in you. It's, it's this unlimited, available power. Use it to demolish the thoughts of the enemy. We're ready. Paul says, I'm ready to, de to, to punish all disobedient thoughts. Everything that's raised against the knowledge of God. I'm just going to headlock it and just pound in that thing, and it's going to be broken. <laughs> Some of the guys are losing it here. That's good. You've got to get a little bit stirred up. If you're just passive, about your negative thoughts. You know, you just think, oh, I'm just going to just suck on my thumb and just wallow in this negativity for a while. Maybe I'll do it for a few weeks. I'm going to have a really good time for a few months. You know, I'm just going to think all kinds of depressing thoughts. Why? You're free. You're, you're in Christ. You've been raised a new creature in Christ. All old things have passed away. All things have become new. You have power. You have authority. You have dominion in Christ. Take that thought and just crush it under your feet. Yeah. Say, you're a liar. You're a lion devil. I'm a demon, demon, and get out of my life. Yeah. You're, you're not going to rule in my life. You're not going to have dominion in me. I'm going to take authority in that. You just, you got to get some aggression in you. Use the power that you have. So we're destroying false arguments. We're taking every thought obedient to Christ. We're punishing every disobedient thought. So the more I connect to the power of God that's working within me, the more power is going after my disobedient thoughts. The more I connect to the power, so, oh, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I just worship you today. Man, I'm feeling the power of God. I just feel like, what's that power doing? It's going to start assaulting my demonic thoughts, my, my disobedient thoughts. It's going to say, well, Johnny, you know what? You're thinking about this about yourself, and I'm coming after it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm feeling this. Ah, it's assaulting me. Yeah, it's, it wants you free. It wants to deliver you. The power of God wants you completely free. So when you open yourself up to the power of God, the more that you do that, the more that power is going to begin to assault the th the th your strongholds. Some of our things get broken very easily. Some things, they're so deep within, they're so, the stronghold's so strong, it just takes a, it takes a real assault. Just, you just come against that thing, and finally one day, you, you, it's broken and you're free. Sometimes there's this moment of revelation, there's this moment of, of understanding, and it just becomes powerful what the Lord does. It just becomes this powerful moment. So it's assaulting these things. So it says, until it says, um, I'll just give you a personal. One of the things, um, whenever you're leading, and is any leading anything, one of the, the greatest things that you battle, <laughs> moment of vulnerability here, is loneliness. You're just like, you're just there, and you're just going at it, and you're thinking like, okay, who else is with me? 
Who else cares? Because you're, you, you have something that is so deep in you and so you're so passionate about, and you're experiencing, you know, you're responding to the call of God on your life, but then you're also experiencing a measure of warfare that comes into your life. And, and so you're, you're just going for it. You're just doing it. I'm not talking just, I mean, this is me, but it's not anybody who's leading. And so you're experiencing this level of, of measure of progress, but the measure of assault. And then there's these moments when the Lord, we had a tremendous 24 hours of prayer from six Friday night to six last night. I was here several times, different stretches. And each time, the anointing that was in the room was so powerful. And he's had some tremendous times. The last time Chris and I came about f four or something like that, whatever, 4.30, we came for the last little bit. And I, my prayer during that, we actually had this Spokane, uh, we had these letters set up for Spokane with a section. The anointing on it was so powerful in this section. I spent quite a bit of time in that section because I could just feel the Lord on our city. So this last bit I'm praying, God, I want and I want a true apostolic church in Spokane. Why? I mean, this, this, like, this is so deep in me. I want a true expression of an apostolic church in Spokane. I want the full measure of what an apostolic church looks like. So this is my prayer. I'm just, I'm just praying this. I'm feeling the Holy Spirit come on me. I'm feeling it very powerful. When I'm in the middle of that prayer, uh, all of a sudden, I am very... Uh, aware of angelic, uh, angelic beings in the room, in, around, around here. And um, I, I just, you know, I, and whenever God touches me, then I always cry. So, I, you know, kind of crying, or just responding to the Lord. And I just, I'm feeling this presence of angels. I mean, like, it's like, like I know it intellectually, but like it was just, it's just, I can feel these, there, I wasn't seeing them with my eyes, but I could just, I could, I knew that there was angels that had come in response to my prayer to establish a true apostolic church in Spokane. I'm like, I just, I knew that it was like a myriad of angels. It was like, it was, it was packed. The room, it's like it was packed with angels that had been dispatched by God to fulfill my prayer. And, and so what am I doing? I'm, I'm, I have this, I'm filled with power I'm moving towards my goal. And then what does the Lord do? He gives us spiritual, my voice is going, he gives us spiritual weapons that become the things that destroy. So whatever the enemy wants to come against my thoughts, my struggle, my whatever, all of a sudden, I, like the reality is I am surrounded by a myriad company of angels that are here to help me help this church become all it's supposed to do. We're not alone. You know, whatever the crazy movies, you're not alone. You know, it's like some sci-fi, you know, aliens. No, we're, we actually have angelic beings that are here that are commissioned. You have not only the power of the Holy Spirit, you have angelic beings that are assigned to you to fulfill the call of God on your life. God has dispatched heavenly help. It's Hebrews I don't give you an exact quote, but they, they have been sent out to render assistance to all those who will inherit salvation. 112 is what I want to say, but I may be wrong. It's somewhere in there. First part of Hebrews. So we have these, these things. So we have to understand that there's, there's this ability to receive. When we're receiving the power of God, we're, we're, what happened? In my prayer, the atmosphere shifted for me. The atmosphere changed for me. All of a sudden, God, in my prayer, there was a response from heaven that gave me this revelation like, John, I'm just dispatching myriads of angels, and they're there with you, and they're going to get you into where you want to be. And so it just becomes a powerful, transforming life. All of you can experience the exact same things. You can, you can experience things in God that are powerful. So he says, uh, we're ready to punish every disobedience when, you're, when your obedience is complete. So Paul's saying here, we're punishing every disobedience that when your obedience is complete, you actually can finish this. My voice is getting really funny. You actually can finish this where your obedience in your thought life can become complete. Like you can completely come into your thought life. This is Paul saying, this is the scripture. Your thought life can completely come into obedience where all you're thinking is the thoughts of Christ. That other thoughts cannot penetrate. I don't, I'm not there yet, but 
that's, that's out there. That's what God is calling us to do. So we're, we're calling all thoughts. Can you repeat to, that one more time? I'll try. <laughs> he says, I'm punishing all disobedience until your obedience is complete. So he's saying it actually is possible that your obedience can be completed. Your obedience of your thought life, because I'm taking every thought captive to Christ, to the knowledge of Christ. I'm taking every thought captive. That obedience can actually become a completed thing. It can actually become a thing in your life where you, you're walking and other thoughts cannot get in. I'm speculating that that will take a focused lifestyle. That will take a, you can't just randomly let your mind wander and go wherever it wants to go. It's going to take a, a measure of spiritual discipline in your heart and your life and, a, and a, probably a season of deep training where you're saying, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm punishing and recognizing and punishing every demonic th idle thought that comes to mind. And so as you exercise that muscle, you become more and more like, ah, I wake up and I'm thinking good thoughts. I feel hopeful. I feel like, man, I'm, I'm going to go take the world today. I'm going to go kick the devil. I'm going to go do something powerful. Something great's going to happen. You become that place of obedience. So our mind becomes per permeated with the thoughts of Christ. We fill our minds with the thoughts of Christ. Uh, last verse here, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. So to, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that Paul had, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. He was very specific. A messenger of Satan is a demonic spirit to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should, should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you, so grace is connected to power. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is per made perfect in weakness. When we think about weakness, we honestly think it's just the exact opposite of power. We think if I'm weak, then I'm just exactly opposite of power. Like, I, I don't have any power because I'm weak. Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm powerful. He thinks completely different. He says, when I'm in my weakness is my, my weakness is what, in your weakness is when your power is perfected. It's when your power is completed. It's when we invite God into our places of our weaknesses is when his power becomes manifest in our life. If, it, if it's always in our own strength and our own ability and what we can do, we don't really have any need for the power because we're doing it ourselves. We're doing what we think we need to do. But if we recognize, here's my weaknesses, then the power comes, and the weakness actually becomes a landing strip, a landing place. The power comes, and it lands on your weakness, and that power becomes manifest in your life. It begins to manifest the power of God in your life, where your weakness. So what does Paul say? What does he do? He's, a, he's a, in this place acknowledging his weakness. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What are we talking about? My, I, my faith is resting on the power of God. How does that happen? It happens when you bring your weaknesses to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm weak. I can't do this. And the Lord said, okay, I'm going to bring my power on that weakness, and I'm going to allow that power to manifest in your life. The power of God. So we want to hide our weaknesses. We want to, don't let anybody see my weaknesses. Don't let, I'm going to run from my weaknesses. The Paul says, I'm boasting about my weaknesses. I'm boasting in the places that I don't have ability. I'm boasting in my lack. I'm boasting in things that I feel like, ah, oh, man, I'm just struggling in this area. I mean, I don't know. Paul says, I was in weak, and I was trembling, and I was fearful, kind of talking to you. I think, why did the power of God manifest so strongly in Paul's ministry? He was coming in his weakness, in his speak, in his speak, like that. Then my voice goes out. And there's a weakness in my voice. And so, man, let the power come. I let my voice crack. If the power comes, that's awesome. So Paul was saying, in my weaknesses, 
I'm boasting in that thing. I'm not trying to hide. I'm not trying to be like, oh man, I'm just a superstar and I don't ever have any problems. I don't have any struggles. He's saying I'm allowing my weaknesses to be exposed. I'm boasting in those things, my inability, so that the power of God might land on me and become manifest in my life and it becomes this great expression of the power of God. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my, uh, of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ Then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we think that we think, <laughs> my voice is <laughs> hysterical. <laughs> Maybe I haven't talked for two weeks and so my voice just isn't whatever. <laughs> that's just funny. Um, I'm never out to preach a perfect message, so that's not my goal. My goal is to move your hearts and to move you into something full with Christ. So if I look stupid doing it, that's okay. I don't care. <laughs> um, so I lost my thought. <laughs> so our weaknesses, we just, we, we embrace those. We embrace, Lord, here's my struggle. Here, honestly, so much of what the Lord uses is he uses weak people. You look throughout the scriptures, the, the greatest leaders that God uses, pretty much every one of them are, is somebody, you know, most, I can't speak, I stutter, I don't do very well. I mean, just all of them, I'm the least of the least, my family's the least of the least. I mean, I'm just, I'm doing that. Chris is putting out a, a cough drop for me or thing, so I'll stick that in there. I'm almost done, so. Don't click it on my teeth. I'll try hard not to. <laughs> so, the God, the God uses our weaknesses. So we want to, again, we want to run from them. We want to hide from them. We want to disguise ourselves. We want to put on a face and a mask. And, you know, Paul says, I'm boasting about them because I know that's where I'm going to become strong. What was John talking about last week? Coming into a community where we can actually connect at a, at a more real level, a deeper level. What happens when we do that? We expose our weaknesses. What happens? The power of God comes into our lives and we're transformed into powerful people. If we're all isolated, alone, pretending we're somebody we're not, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. It doesn't come. So we're doing that. I said last scripture, but I didn't lie. I just didn't think about this one last scripture. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, will we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing greatness, the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We're in vessels, our physical bodies, that allow us to get the power of God. So, Lord, right now, I just come to you, Lord. I just say, Lord, let our faith individually, as families, as a church family, Lord, our faith is resting on the power of God. My faith for this church, Lord, in the future of this church is resting on the power of God. Lord, I know you've given us the power of the Holy Spirit that's living within us. I know that a greater revelation yesterday of the angelic beings that have been released to us to accomplish all our work that you've called us to do to become who we're called to be. And Lord, right now, the power of the word of God that can come into our lives that demolish arguments, every lie, every opinion, every reasoning that's set up against the knowledge of God, Lord, we loose the power of those weapons right now in every person's life. Lord, I loose the power of the truth of the word of God to come right now and to assault every logic, every reasoning, every thing that's been put into people's heart and life Lord, I break those things right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we are called to be completely free. Completely free. Completely free of every demonic thought. Every thought of limitation. We've been called to be completely free in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we lose the power right now. Lord, I lose the power of God over my life or each person's life right now. I release the power of God to come into our hearts, into our lives. Break every chain now in Jesus' name. Break every chain now. Every thought of limitation, break it now in Jesus' name. Break it now. Break it now, God. Every limiting thought, break it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Break every limiting thought now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Father. Lord, we don't run from our weakness, but we invite you into our weaknesses right now. I invite you into my limitations. I invite you into my places that I don't, I don't have ability, but you do. God, I invite you right now into my land on my weaknesses. Land on my weaknesses. Land on the weaknesses of this house. Land on the weaknesses that's out, that are out there. God, land on them now in Jesus' name. Land on them now in Jesus' name. The power of God. Lord, the power of God manifesting in this place. Taking us beyond where we can ask or think, God. Transforming us into the full stature of the image of Christ, of the knowledge of the full stature of Christ, the mature man, God. Take us, Lord, into that place where every thought, Lord, is laid captive to Christ. Every thought must obey Christ in Jesus' name. Every thought, every thought obeying Christ now in Jesus' name. Every thought obeying Christ. We cast out every vain imagination now in Jesus' name. Every vain imagination, go in the name of Jesus. Go in the name of Jesus. Every vain imagination, go. You will be taken captive to the obedience of Christ now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for your power. Thank you for your power, Lord. God, transform our city, transform our nation. God, every vain imagination, every false argument, God, every reasoning, Lord, from the devil, God, take it, demolish it, God. Lord, destroy strongholds of darkness now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are powerful because we've been made powerful in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, I pray for dreams. I pray for revelation. I pray for encounters. I pray for, Lord, angelic encounters. I pray for, Lord, your word just exploding in the hearts and the spirits of your people. God, let the fire of God come on the word of God. Let the fire of God burn into the word of God that comes a powerful spiritual weapon that transforms our life, that breaks every lie of the enemy, God, that we're not even conscious of, Lord, that will just break every limiting thing right now in Jesus' name. Breathe on your word, God. Let it come on fire now in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit, come now. Come, Holy Spirit, come and breathe on your people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, let this month be a month of power encounters of August. Lord, let it be a month of power and counter. Let us anticipate. Lord, we're setting our faith, we're resting our faith completely on the power of God. So, Lord, let us rest our faith right now on the power of God. Thank you, God. Life transforming experiences this month of August. Life encounters, life changing encounters now in the name of Jesus. We're just going to put a definitive time. Well, right now, God, life in encountering moments right now. Life changing moments now in the name of Jesus. Life changing moments now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Out of our ruts and into the fullness of God, the full plan of God for our life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Whoa, I was, <laughs> I thought I was there. That I was, <laughs> Woo. yeah, get a little. This is our name, man.